Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control, IIT Bombay. So, welcome to week seven of this course on nonlinear adaptive control. And uh, by week six, we have already started to learn uh, about designing algorithms that can potentially drive systems such as what we see in our background, which is essentially a SpaceX satellite orbiting the Earth. So uh, to summarize a little bit of what we did in week six was that we started with a, a first order scalar system. So a very, very simple sort of a system, right? So we started with the first order scalar system and we designed an adaptive controller for this system. All right. So um, we, uh, the way we worked uh, through it is that we started by designing a controller for the known case. Uh, and then we um, use the certainty equivalence principle in order to design the unknown case adaptive controller. So the adaptive controller essentially consists of a parameter estimator which feeds into the <clears throat> normal control signal. All right. So this is what we did for the first order case. So we had this kind of a controller and then we of course had a parameter estimator. All right. Now, <clears throat> uh, further that, of course we use signal chasing and so on to prove that everything works out fine. Uh, further that we started to look at the second order system. And of course, when we used like a, like a very, very standard or a basic choice of Lyapunov candidate function, as you would, uh, we realize that we end up with a, a detectability obstacle. All right. So this is uh, because of the fact that we chose a non-strict Lyapunov function. All right. And <clears throat> so what we try to do after that is um, essentially uh, use something like an Ortega construction in order to overcome this detectability obstacle for second order scalar systems. All right. And that's what we did in this section four. Um, we first showed how to use this for the, uh, like a, how this construction works for the general uh, stability proof for a system like 4.1, which is like a spring mass damper system. And uh, then we used it for our adaptive control problem in this section. And we showed that uh, with this sort of a construction, which is not even a Lyapunov function, in fact, it is what we like to call a Lyapunov-like function, uh, we could show that both uh, the states, that is the E1 and E2, uh, converge to the origin as we desire. All right, so, so this is where we stopped. Now, what we, uh, where we start off today is, <coughs> with the notion of backstepping in adaptive control. Now, backstepping is a very, very uh, well-known and classical, by now classical uh, method in uh, nonlinear control, all right? Uh, and in recent years, it has also uh, gained a lot of popularity in uh, adaptive control community also, all right? Now, <clears throat> so, so basically this is where we start. Let me first mark the starting point of our lectures in week seven, right? Um, so uh, basically we already see uh, or have seen that we have these detectability obstacles that do bother us. One of the ways to get around it was something like a Ortega construction, which may or may not work for more general adaptive control problems. It was very specific if you notice to like a spring mass damper type system, all right? So we are not quite confident if um, you know if, if this will work out very well um, if it was not in this particular kind of a structure. On the other hand, backstepping is well known to be a you know, rather general method. Okay, um, and so we want to uh, explore this idea of backstepping for the same uh, double integrator system that we had 
uh, or non-linear double integrator system that we were looking at. All right. So backstepping is, of course, well known to be a method to generate strictly Apollon functions for non-linear systems. Great. So let's go back to the table and, and uh, look at our usual double integrator dynamical system, which is, I mean, we're calling it a double integrator, but it's a non-linear double integrator because of this. And as always, we have an unknown theta star and some function f of x t, where x is, uh, of course, composed of both x1 and x2. Right, x consists of both x1 and x2 states. And um, we, as always, our typical objective is that our states, our, our x1 states track some trajectory r, and the x1 dot accordingly tracks some trajectory r dot. Right. This is obviously because of the matching condition, right? Because our dynamics dictates that uh, x1 dot is x2. Therefore, the trajectories also have to be identically designed. Yeah. So we cannot have any arbitrary trajectory for x1 and x2, but they have to be related by the derivative. And this is essentially the matching condition that we have already spoken about in detail in the previous week. All right. Great. Uh, and so the steps are pretty standard. So as you go on, you will start getting used to, uh, you know, sort of doing these steps again and again. All right. So what do we do next? We essentially derive the transform dynamics. That is now we have generated or created an error variable. And our aim is to, as always, drive these errors to zero. Right. And so now, you know, all these Lyapunov theory of considering the origin to be the equilibrium point, it all should start to make sense to all of you by now. Yeah. So what is the error dynamics? E1 dot comes out to be E2 and E2 dot is theta star F plus U minus R double dot. So I'm not even going to try to explain how we got to 1.3 and 1.4 because we've already done this in the previous week. Yeah. So if you are, uh, if you still have any confusion, please go back and refer to the notes from the previous week. All right. So great. So now we have this dynamics, a potentially unknown quantity theta star. And we want to do the standard adaptive control design. All right. Now we already know from last week that if we use some uh, standard Lyapunov candidate like a, um, you know, V equals to uh, x1 squared by 2 plus, say, x2 squared by, sorry, no x1 and x2, but if I use something basic like e1 squared by 2 plus e2 squared by 2, then I will land up in some trouble. Okay, and, and and this will lead to leads to detectability obstacle. Yeah, this will lead to a detectability obstacle. All right. So <clears throat> we already know that. Yeah. And what was the way around it? We used an Ortega construction. Yeah. So now we will try to do the same thing with backstepping. So think of this as like a beginning step. And it, it sort of a apples to apples comparison between the two methods. Yeah, just look at it as that and nothing more. Yeah, for now. But of course, uh, you will see uh, because this backstepping based adaptive control is something we will do for uh, several sessions now. Yeah, so you will start to see that this has uh, you know, much further implications than the Ortega construction. It can be used in many, many more contexts than you can use Ortega construction. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, well, and, and of course, you will also understand that the Ortega construction itself is sort of inspired by uh, backstepping based methods. Okay. Great. So what do we do in backstepping? In case uh, for those who do not know or those who do not have not done this kind of a nonlinear control design course before this, we first uh, look at the first piece of dynamics, which is E1 dot equal to E2. Forget about the second piece. Just look at the first piece. And we will assume that E2 is the control. So this variable right here, that is the second state, is assumed as the control for the first state. Okay. Remember, this is merely an assumption, an idealization. Yeah. For the purpose of design, you cannot actually think of e2 as the control because it is in fact a state of the system so if i was thinking of a robot e1 would be the position error and e2 would be the velocity error right again think of an airplane 
E1 is be the position error, E2 would be the velocity error. Okay, it's not uh, actually a control but a state of the system. All right, but we assume it for now again for the sake of the design. Yeah, so what do we do? If you assume E2 to be the control, we want to design a stabilizing control, right? As obvious, I mean, whenever we design a controller, we want it to be stabilizing. And what do we, what would be the stabilizing control? Remember, we always try to choose a model, right? We always try to choose a model. So what is a good model in this case? We know that if I have any E1 dot is minus K1 E1 for any K1 positive, then we know that is an exponentially decaying system. Yeah. So this is what we've been doing. We've been choosing a sort of ideal system to follow. And this is, well, ideal enough for us, right? So that's what we do. We choose E2 and we call it E2 desired, E2D, because again, we know that in reality, E2 cannot be exactly this. So we call it E2 desired and we define it as exactly this quantity, minus K1 E1 with a positive scale k1 yeah and we know that this is under ideal circumstances if e2 was exactly e2 desired or e2d then it will exponentially stabilize the system yeah great now we of course also um, introduce a corresponding lyapunov candidate function because honestly speaking backstepping is a method of generating uh, Lyapun of candidates by augmenting one piece to another piece. Okay, it's actually not a method of control design, but a method of generating candidate Lyapun of functions. And you, as you might have already seen, we are by now used to design parameter update laws and control using, well, I mean, not the control yet, but the parameter update laws are being designed using a Lyapun of candidate. We take a derivative. And we choose a parameter update law so that we ensure that v dot is negative semi definite. So this is called Ryapunov of redesign, right? And that's what we are used to doing. Okay, so it's like um, we are not doing all that in this course, the notions of control Lyapunov of functions, but essentially what we are doing is choosing a control Lyapunov of function and getting a corresponding um, feedback u or in this case theta hat, which is making v dot negative semi-definite at least okay all right so we of course choose a corresponding lyapunov function for this ideal system yeah not the even dot equal to e2 system but the ideal system which is this system and what is a good lyapunov candidate it's very straightforward just take the first obvious quadratic that you can think of yeah and we have been doing this for a while now okay of course if this was something more complicated you would not be able to choose a quadratic. But in this case, because it isn't, I get to choose the quadratic. And again, in the ideal case, yeah, V1 dot is minus K1 E1 square. Yeah, in fact, I can even, uh, it might even not be <coughs> completely wrong to say this is V1D. Yeah, because it is like V1 desired. Yeah, and then this we say clearly when E2 is exactly equal to E2 desired. Now we go to the second step where we really understand that E2 is not really the control. So what's the next best thing we can do? Yeah, so I'm actually trying to help you understand also what is backstepping, all right? So what's the next best thing I can do? I know that E2 is not identically equal to E2 design, but what I can do maybe, hopefully, is that I can drive E2 to E2 design. I will make E2 desired as the signal that E2 has to track. Okay, remember my earlier objective was for E1 and E2 to go to zero. All right, but now I'm sort of shifting the goalpost. It looks like, yeah. So what I'm going to say is that now I don't want E2 to go to zero. Yeah, as T goes to infinity, but I actually want E2 to track E2 desired. Now one might ask, uh, does this mess with the original control objective? Yeah, because we were, of course, 
trying to um, you know go to zero and now we are trying to go to e to design so one might ask am i am i actually messing with the original control objective we will answer this suspense uh, soon all right so so what we do is we define this because we want to drive e2 to e2 design we will design we will of course define a new variable psi2 and this psi2 is defined as the error between e2 and e2 design so this is what we've been always doing whatever we want to drive to zero we define a new variable right so if you want e2 to go to e2 design we define a variable as the error between the two e2 minus e2 design and that is psi2 in this case and so if i plug in for e2 design yeah because it was minus k1 e1 i simply get psi2 is e2 plus k1 e1 all right i guess i get psi2 is e2 plus k1 e1 okay great and now what do i do construct the dynamics for this error same steps the steps are similar all right find compute an error that you want to drive to zero compute the dynamics of the error then start to do liapano analysis on that all right so the steps are standard so there should be no confusion as to what direction you need to do when you start with a problem always try to construct an error then try to design a liapan of candidate then try to define a control then try to find an update law same steps okay anyway so as of now we are not even assuming until this point we are not assuming theta star is unknown so we will find the dynamics of psi2 which is psi2 dot which is e2 dot plus k1 e1 dot so k1 e1 dot is just k1 e2 and e2 dot is just the dynamics plugged in from above all right okay great now what do we do we add an additional we add a new piece to the lyapunov candidate so which is again just a quadratic half psi2 squared because we want to drive psi2 to zero so this is the obvious choice okay and therefore we get v2 dot as psi2 multiplied by psi2 dot which is just this quantity okay now if i choose my control to be of this form what is this form this form is essentially trying to cancel everything and introduce a good term yeah because the other terms are not definite so we don't know how how they will behave so what we do is we try to get rid of them and we introduce a good term of course we are calling this theta hat okay which is an estimate of theta star but uh i would say uh for the known case for the known case we use theta hat equal to theta star right when we actually know the value of the parameter theta hat is just equal to theta star right and then what are we left with v2 dot is minus k2 psi2 square okay v2 dot is minus k2 psi2 square and what happens v equal to v1 plus v2 serves as a strictly apollonian function okay so this is not complete yet yeah because remember what we computed here was v1 desired dot not actually v1 dot so the analysis is a little bit remaining so if i take and i will do that here now i will complete that here if i do take v equal to v1 plus v2 and now i compute the actual derivative instead of the desired derivatives v1 was if you notice half e1 squared so this is e1 e1 dot and v2 is psi2 psi2 dot psi2 psi2 dot all right so this is e1 dot is e2 and psi2 psi2 dot is what we just did this uh psi2 in fact psi2 psi2 dot is just uh wait a second yeah that's fine psi2 psi2 dot is exactly this guy minus a2 psi2 square yeah. as of now there is no definiteness here does not seem very evident however notice that we had transformed e2 to psi2 so i have to write e2 in terms of psi2 so what is e2 in terms of psi2 i can get that from here 
So E2 is simply psi2 minus k1 e1 and this is minus k2 psi2 square right so now i start to see nice things this is minus k1 e1 squared minus k2 psi2 squared plus e1 times psi2 okay now we use a very very standard trick <coughs> which says that absolute value of AB is less than or equal to A squared plus B squared. Okay, so we use that to write this quantity as less than or equal to minus K1 E1 squared minus K2 E2. Uh, psi2 square plus half e1 square plus half psi2 square all right and now this can get, be clubbed with this guy and this can be clubbed with this guy so if k1 is larger than half and k2 is larger than half right then this is negative definite implies v dot is strictly negative definite right so i got a strict lyapunov function notice this was a strict lyapunov function okay so if both k1 and k2 which are essentially gains of our choice this is like a control game that the designer can choose and as long as these k1 and k2s are greater than half then i'm guaranteed to have v dot to be negative definite yeah so this method that 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 you sort of go from here to here using this kind of an inequality is called the sum of squares method okay this is called the sum of squares method and we will constantly refer to this terminology so whenever i say sum of squares method it means that i took the mixed terms which look like 2ab yeah so so notice that these things all they've written it in in terms of absolute values apologize right all they've written it in terms of absolute values this can actually be written in terms of norms this is like a norm inequality also no problem yeah this is essentially like a uh, i mean i mean i mean this is just a standard a squared plus b squared plus 2ab equal to a plus b whole square type of inequality right this is just using the fact uh, you know that a, plus a minus b whole square is greater than or equal to c yeah so that's what this is using right so this is just using that a minus b whole square is greater than or equal to c or some such thing right but uh, you can we also use things like the cauchy schwartz inequality that we saw some time ago triangle inequality cauchy schwartz inequality and things like that so so all these inequalities come into play when we are using the sum of squares method the idea behind the sum of squares method um, is to use any technique any inequality standard inequalities which will help you convert the mixed terms into um, square terms which can then be combined right which can then be combined with this term the other square terms Right? because that's what we did right because i have no idea of saying how big this is in comparison to these guys so what i do is i write it as a sum of squares and then this can be combined now with this and this can be combined with this and so now i have a way of saying that if k1 and k2 are greater than half then i'm good to go now remember that this is pretty conservative okay this is fairly conservative we can also do another thing the only thing is it doesn't help us write it analytically very nicely but i can always write this whole thing as a uh, quadratic form which is like this which i e1 uh, let me see e1 psi2 and e1 
psi 2 if i write it like that then this is uh, k1 k2 half and half all right so what you want what you want in reality is that uh, this matrix in between be positive definite right you have to choose the gains k1 k2 such that this matrix is positive definite and in fact the conditions for that are pretty straightforward yeah i, I hope all of you know this this just requires that the principal minors are positive so k1 has to be positive and k1 k2 minus one fourth has to be positive so these are the uh these are the realistic i mean more realistic and of course the least conservative conditions yeah the only thing is it's just uh easier to write it out in this way and more tractable that's it okay so anyway so the steps are not over here once you compute v2 dot the point is when you take v equal to v1 plus v2 and you compute v1 dot yeah earlier we had actually compute only v1 desired dot because we assumed v2 is exactly equal to v2 desired but if you don't then you start to get a additional mixed term e1 e2 and then you write this mixed term as in terms of e psi 2 you get something like this and then you get two nice negative definite terms and a mixed term which you use sum of squares to dominate okay so this is really the idea behind backstepping okay this is the backstepping method for the known case okay this is the backstepping method for the known case now <clears throat> so we are uh, sort of uh, sort of done in this case see so what have we proved we have essentially been able to prove that e1 goes to 0 and psi 2 which is equal to e2 plus k1 e1 goes to 0 right so we have proved these two right because why because we took v as e1 squared plus psi 2 squared by 2 and we proved that v dot is negative semi-definite right so by standard lyapunov theorems both of them e1 and psi 2 have to go to zero and of course everything is asymptotically stable and all that nice jazz all right excellent now we had asked ourselves a question does this mess with our original objective of driving the errors to zero the answer is no why because we just proved that e1 goes to zero right and e2 plus k1 e1 goes to zero but then because in this piece e1 is already going to zero what we have essentially proved is that e2 also has to go to zero right in this if this summation is going to zero and this piece is already going to zero from here then the only way the summation can go to zero is if this guy also goes to zero right if this guy was not going to zero then e2 would have been non-zero as t goes to infinity but that's not the case e1 is in fact already going to zero as t goes to infinity and therefore the only way for the summation psi 2 to go to zero is if e2 also goes to zero right so this is like an equivalent thing so we have essentially been able to recover that e1 and e2 both go to zero right as we require okay excellent so this is sort of how we do backstepping for a general nonlinear system because I, I say that it's for a general nonlinear system because we did not consider any unknowns yeah we assume theta is known theta star is known right so the next step would of course be to go for the unknown theta star yeah so now notice already you should be able to see that the Lyapunov candidate was e1 squared plus psi 2 squared where psi 2 is e2 plus k1 e1 now now this this term is sort of very similar to what you had in the ortega construction right i mean again not the adaptive problem but the non-adaptive problem it's like x2 plus alpha x1 so e2 and in this case you have e2 plus k1 e1 squared so this term essentially looks very much like the ortega construction but then in backstepping there is also this additional term okay so that it becomes a lyapunov candidate and a lyapunov function okay so for this particular case you see that the ortega construction piece is a part of the 
Lyapunov candidate function for the backstep in case. All right, excellent. So what did we look at today? We sort of uh, started to look at backstepping in adaptive control, and we um, started with the non-adaptive problem. Until now, we've done the non-adaptive problem, and we've seen how backstepping control is actually designed. Uh, essentially, backstepping is a way of constructing additional Lyapunov functions by augmenting Lyapunov functions corresponding to each state. Right? And that's what we did. Started with the E1 state, created a Lyapunov candidate, right? And then we started with the E2 state. All right. So that's the idea um, of, of basically constructing these Lyapunov functions. All right. Uh, so we will see further the unknown case in the upcoming session. And I hope to see you there. Thank you.